Welcome to the Access to Innovators podcast, powered by the Premier Life Skills University, High Point University. and thank you for joining us. My name is Megan Hovey. I'm a senior from Rochester, New York, majoring in sports media and minoring in social media marketing. But today I'm going one-on-one with Chris Allman, who is the founder and president of Allman Communications LLC and High Point University strategic communication expert in residence. Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today and joining us. I'm super excited. Well, Megan, I am delighted to be here. I love High Point University, and I'm excited to talk to a fellow New Yorker. I'm from Long Island. Yeah, <laughs> I'm kind of the opposite sides of the state, but yeah. we have that that bond. It's I still guess the Empire say. State. There okay. you go. <laughs> so just kind of getting into it, I mean, I know you said you love coming back to campus. So what exactly attracted you to bring your skills here to High Point University, and what do you think sets HPU students apart? Well, this is a really special place. We first learned about it when my nephew, who's now a senior, came here you know, from four years or so ago. Well, actually, probably five years ago, because when he was touring the school, we actually went on the tour with him. Uh, so we learned about the school, and not a ton, but just enough. And then my son, who's now a junior at High Point, uh, said, wow, his, his cousin, Luke, is having a great time and just learning a lot. He's in sports marketing, just like you. Uh, thinks it's a great degree. And so we learned more and more and more about the school, about its philosophy and the like. And so we were really excited that our son was interested in coming here. And then thankfully he got in. So once our our son was here, then we started visiting more for parents weekend and the like, and uh, just so impressed with the place. Then interestingly, a friend of mine is in the Experts in Residence program, a uh, gentleman by the name of Bill Kennard. Bill is just an amazing man. He's, he's currently the chairman of AT&T. He was the ambassador to the European Union. And we used to work together at an investment firm called the Carlisle Group. So I, Bill told me about this program, and I said, well, that's really neat, that this opportunity to come and lecture and mentor students and uh, help them understand what the real world is like. And, and I looked at the array of experts they had, and amazingly, they did not have a communications expert in residence. So I said to Bill, that should be me. And he said, I agree. So he went to the administration and pitched me, and they said yes. So that's how I got the job. I mean, it's a volunteer job, and it's part-time, uh, both of which are fine with me. Uh, so that's how I got uh, introduced to it. Yeah, and what do you think kind of sets High Point students apart from – you know, other students maybe you've interacted with in kind of your tenure throughout the industry? Well, I I have met many students here, of course, my nephew and my son. And I think what sets the HPU student apart is that their appreciation for kind of what makes this school really special and what makes a school special and which, and it's why it attracts a certain type of student is that there's this very, a direct link between what the students are learning kind of day in and day out and the real world. Now, I'm all for theoretical learning and um, it, things that are you know, just you know, pure knowledge, absolutely. But one of the things I really love about High Point and my son loved about it and many of the students that I've met here is this kind of almost like workforce preparation. So yeah, you're learning skills, and that's really important, but it's the application of it. So the having this experts in residence program, uh, you have the, the internship programs that they make available, and the, the fact that they take it so seriously, you have to like, take a course to prepare yourself to do an internship, because they want those students to make the most of the internship and represent the school well, which I think is good. And President Cobain, of course, is an inspirational leader who places such an emphasis on getting people ready for the real world. And so the students I meet um, and the students that are like you, who like, take their studies seriously, they are good role models for their fellow students. They are really trying to harness what they're learning today so that it will really be applicable in the future. Um, you know, the, the mentoring program here, like every student has a mentor. I think yeah. that's really impressive. I mean, especially when you're a freshman, you come to a school with 6,000 
students and you can feel lost and not sure where to go, having that mentor there. So that that's just kind of one part of this larger spirit of like how the school takes care of the students and prepares them for the postgraduate life. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of going off of that, since you've been on campus so much, what's your favorite part of campus? Oh, I could start with the Chick-fil-A. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Oh my gosh. What do I, all There's right. There's so many good ones. I, I'm going to rattle through. I'm a PR guy, so I'm going to rattle through them. Um, I love the inspirational statues they have. I, I never get tired of it. And I love the international kind of promenade where you just see all the flags from, uh, countries around the world, the fountains, the, uh, the little hangout places where you can contemplate life and the like. Uh, the Cabane Arena is just amazing. Uh, I, I whistled the national anthem there. I'm a, I'm a champion whistler, which is my unusual talents. Uh, and, you know, but ultimately, it's the faculty that is really impressive here. Uh, I've, I've gotten to meet a number of the professors, particularly in the communications department, and they really are passionate. They are smart. They care about their students, and they are... Uh, and, it, and in the spirit of the school, they're very welcoming of practitioners, you know, people like me who have a, a wealth of communications experience to, like, to come into their classroom and feel welcome there and to, to share uh, my experiences and tips and, uh, of the trade with, uh, with students. Like just this morning, I uh, met with a, a group of 25 or so students who are all freshmen uh, most of them are, are communications majors or plan on it. And, you know, the chance to kind of instill uh, some principles of what does it mean to be an effective communicator and and then just some practical things about how to advance through the profession and what makes for uh, an effective communicator and the like. Uh, you know, it's great when the professors, they acknowledge that, that they, they understand that having practitioners come and guest lecture is important so you're you're mixing the academic and the textbook with the real world, and that's really important. Yeah, I can't say enough great things about the faculty here, especially in the communication school. And I know for sure, for me, I've really benefited from people like you coming via Zoom or <laughs> in person just to kind of network and share their experiences. Because like you said, it's so important to just kind of get that exposure to what the real world is like outside of these four walls of the communication school. Mm -hmm. So innovation is in our DNA here at HPU. Can you kind of talk about a time when you innovated your strategies to better serve your clients or people that you work with? Yeah, one of the things I, I talked with the students this morning was the difference between being what I call a message taker and an advisor. And message takers are very good at writing things down, going to the boss and saying, hey, boss, this is what's happening. What do you want to do? An advisor, on the other hand, looks at the, all the facts, which are important, but then comes up with options. Option A, B, and C. Here are the pluses and minuses of each. I recommend B for these reasons. And then you make the case to the boss, to the client. So... My innovation is, is not like some super fancy thing of like some new AI technology, which I do think is important yeah. and is going to have a huge impact on the communications profession. But this simple notion of kind of pushing back against um, you know, maybe just kind of the normal way of doing things. And when you're an advisor, you're almost always pushing back. Because a lot of times clients will want to do a certain thing, but as the advisor, you're saying, well, there may be a better approach. All right. So with that as a foundation, I'll give you an example. And so PR people, and I've seen this throughout my career, tend to focus on kind of things versus humans. And let me explain that. So uh, I had a client who is a billionaire, and this billionaire really love to help homeless people. So he wrote a $5 million check to this homeless uh, assistance organization in Washington, DC. And the PR people at the homeless shelter came to me and said, all right, we've written a press release and we need your approval because we're sending it out tomorrow. 
And and I said, uh, well, first of all, what's the rush? But yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll review your press release. And so they were focused on kind of the, the what. Billionaire gives $5 billion to help homeless people. Now, that's a good thing. But as an advisor, rather than just a kind of a box checker, oh, I, I proofed your release and it's fine. You know, I didn't add much value there. But as an advisor, I then looked at this release and said, what is your objective? Not because a press release is, a, is just a vessel. It's not a strategy. And in a vessel, you pour content into it. But they were pouring the wrong content into it. They were, they were just talking about the billionaire giving the money to help the homeless people. But what we were missing was who benefits. Well, homeless people benefit. And I said, well, that is what we should be focused on. And since their objective was to get a story in the Washington Post, then just taking a news release and sending it to 50 reporters in the Washington area, just talking about the billionaire and how generous he is, it's not going to get you anything. So what I said to them is what we should do is, and it's serving as an advisor, is focus on the humanity of it. Let's focus on the outcome, that this money is going to help actual humans get on their feet. And at first, the PR people were like, oh, no, no, we have a deadline. we got to get the press release out. And I said, no, trust me, this will be much better. So I finally convinced them. So what then they, I then made a connection to a reporter at the Washington Post. And I then step away. And two and a half months go by. And on Christmas morning, I go out to pick up my newspaper, the Washington Post. And there is the story on the front page, top of the fold, featuring not the billionaire, but the homeless families that were actually benefiting from this $5 million gift and the housing that they now have and a warm, safe place on Christmas morning. Now that is just, it's a great way to do PR, of course. And, and you might think, oh, my client's upset now because he doesn't get all the attention. I mean, he didn't even want the attention. Like they kind of made him make this announcement. Yeah. But of course, if you're gonna make an announcement, it should be effective. So the greatest innovation and is almost like just doing it the, the kind of the old fashioned way, which is let's get away from mechanics and let's get away from things and let's humanize. So I am constantly injecting the kind of the human component into how we communicate. And it, it makes a remarkable difference in both how the media will kind of perceive this news and then the audience, when, when they see it, they're much more likely to have a um, more intimate and kind of emotional reaction if they're hearing about a human and what they're going through rather than just some rich guy giving a check. Yeah, absolutely. And as you know, High Point places a really big emphasis on giving back to the local community. And you've previously served as an advisor to the American Red Cross and helped them kind of work through their communication strategy. How are you able to do that, knowing that donations are still urgently needed and were still urgently needed? Well, I, I just love the Red Cross. So I first got exposed to them when I was 18 years old, and I, I gave my first pint of blood. <laughs> and this is crazy, but I just gave my 11th gallon. Not all at once, of course. You know, there are eight pints in a gallon. So I gave my 88th wow. pint of blood. So I've actually worked with the Red Cross uh, as a donor for 42 years. And then uh, I, I got named to the board for the, the greater Washington area. And that was a great experience. And, you know, board members uh, for nonprofit organizations uh, typically have several roles to do. You have to raise money. And you have to kind of get the word out uh, among different audiences so that they, too, will support the organization with their time, talent, treasure, and the like. And then kind of strategic guidance as well. And so I gave a number of suggestions to the, the Red Cross kind of uh, president at the time and their PR people, uh, again, focusing on humanity. You know, how do we take either a disaster and humanize it? Or how do we take the need for blood and humanize it? And it's not like they weren't doing this, but I tried to give them tips on how to maximize it. And uh, that, that way of humanizing it 
is, I think, much more powerful because if you have blood in your body, but you've never given blood, if you actually realize the impact it has on hu an actual human, that every pint you give can save three humans. Now, you'll probably never meet these people, but just the fact that you're able to you know, change a life, save a life yeah. by just having someone stick a needle in your arm, which are nowhere near as painful as people think. I don't, I actually watch them put the needle in. Oh, uh, okay. Because it, uh, I kind of critique the, the phlebotomist, you know. <laughs> I mean, you've done it so many times. I think you have pretty good. I do. I have a, a good, I, I actually, I couldn't do it because I've actually never done it, meaning putting yes. the needle in. But I actually know when they're doing a good job. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and most of them are very good. <laughs> <laughs> and I know we talked a little bit about artificial intelligence and all of that kind of stuff, but I kind of want to dive deeper into that. So with it being more prevalent than ever, especially in the communications world, especially with things like chat GBT and things like that, how do you think the industry will be able to pivot and what advice would you give to current students like myself looking to enter the communications industry and looking to compete against these robots and these kind of this is such being. an important issue i mean it's it's both uh dazzlingly exciting yes and astoundingly frightening <laughs> and in terms of the good because any new technology has at least i shouldn't say any new tech technology but ai has a lot of good potential and a huge downside as well and I've been telling my children this. I have a 21-year-old, 20, and a 17-year-old. Is that like, this is big and it's going to be huge. So you uh, ignore it at your peril. So if you look at the communications profession and how AI will affect it, you know the 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 challenge with AI is that it's for the most part not creating things from scratch. It is assembling stuff that it finds. So if there's a lot of junk out there, all it's going to do is find the junk and rearrange it into a different form of junk. So that's not good. So the key is how do you harness it so that it will actually help produce good stuff? And you know, I try not to be a Luddite when it comes to technology, and, and I am – a fan of efficiency and the like. So if should we use AI to write the first drafts of documents? Yeah, I'm not opposed to that, uh, but it should not be the final draft. That is for sure. Because you will just get, again, this kind of accumulation of stuff that's already out there. And I tend to think a lot of the press releases that are out there are just not well written. So if the AI little robots or whatever they are, are out there just taking bits and pieces of poorly written press releases and reassembling them. I mean, that that's bad. So I, I think some of the, the lessons for communicators are that you should know a lot about AI, what it can do and what it can do best, and then what are the things that really doesn't work well. Because if you, if you remove the human component from it, that is just, it's just bad because it will take away the creativity. So it's sort of like any new t technology, especially a time-saving technology, you know, is generally a good thing and because it frees up our time to do higher level things. So as AI in the communications world in particular starts doing some of the very basic things, I say, well, that's fine. But so students and then practitioners of communications, what they must do is make sure that their value-added skills are like developed and kind of omnipresent. Yeah. So that when they get that first draft produced by the AI, they don't just sign off on and say, oh, well, that was brilliant, because <laughs> there's no way it's going to be brilliant. But they can take that and because of their the knowledge base they have about the, the subject that they're reporting on or, or uh, doing PR for that the machine probably doesn't have. Machines don't have nuance. They don't understand politics. They don't understand um, kind of market differentiation necessarily. So there are going to be a ton of areas that AI 
especially in this first wave, just can't do. So that's where the students must really bone up on their skill sets so that they're always adding value. And then figuring out how to harness the AI to uh, be efficient, because that's good, and then to perhaps be more thorough in terms of like the search for data. I mean, it's hard to say that's a bad thing. Right. Uh, but then use that brain, that human brain, to uh, for the creativity and the discernment that a AI just does not have. Yeah, I love that. So you're known around the world pretty much as the happy whistler. Mm -hmm. So can you explain how you developed and shared your special gift? I mean, how did you take up whistling? Well, I am, uh, I am a happy whistler. And so I love whistling. Uh, I've been whistling for 55 years. I just turned 60 and I started when I was five. Now in the early days, I was not particularly good, but I still enjoyed doing it. So you know, in a nutshell, you know, some people can whistle. It's a physiological thing. Some people just can't. So thankfully I'm able to whistle. And I was exposed to it. My father was uh, a pretty accomplished whistler. He wasn't a champion, <laughs> but he had a very beautiful sounding whistle and just loved to do it all the time. And it brought him joy and brought me joy just listening to him. So the exposure to that and it got me kind of just into it. And then I started practicing, like literally practicing, not just kind of randomly whistling. Yeah. Uh, so I would listen to classical music primarily as a child. So I I'd put on... Uh, Strauss waltzes in particular, and that's still my favorite rehearsal music is Strauss waltzes because the the complexity of the music, the range, the requirement to have like little techniques that kind of mimic the instruments. So that is a core reason why I just enjoy whistling. But what I that's for my personal satisfaction. What I found though is I can use this whistling to bring joy to other people. Uh, so I have a, a what I call a whistling ministry. So I actually, I whistle happy birthday 650 times a year. And so the, what's interesting about this little happy birthday ministry is that typically when it comes to w wishing someone a happy birthday, you know, of course, your family and then your best friends and maybe your coworkers, or if you're a student, your dorm mates or housemates or something like that. And, and that's good. And, you know, maybe that's, 15, 20 people or so, but I, I get to kind of inject myself into a, a, a happy moment for 650 people a year and to kind of honor their life, bring them some joy in a, in a fun way. And I routinely get notes and it's why this, it, it's real great positive feedback mechanism is that I happily whistle for someone. And then they send me these sweet notes that you made my day. Now my day is complete. And I have friends I've been whistling happy birthday for because I started in, I think, 95. So it's been 25, 28 years or so of happy birthday whistles. And anyway, so that brings me a lot of joy because I can bring joy to others. And, and I've just done a lot of fun things with it. I've performed with symphony orchestras and I whistle the national anthem at events. I'm whistling tomorrow uh, at a high point uh, women's soccer game, the oh. national anthem. So I'm excited about that. I've whistled at the top of the Washington Monument on the outside, not in the observation deck, but literally on the outside when they had scaffolding on it, 555 feet in the air. I whistled Yankee Doodle Dandy. That's a, a whole nother crazy story. So it's been uh, it's been a great journey. Uh, I have a CD of forming with uh, symphony orchestra, and I've written a book about it. I've done TED talks, and uh, and my kind of core message, aside from the happy birthdays, is you know what is your simple gift in life, and can you find it? And the name of my book is called Find Your Whistle. It's a metaphor for yeah. what is your simple gift, and you know so you. Find the gift, develop the gift, share the gift. And, and I take this in a counterintuitive approach, which is don't try to change the world. It's really not possible. You know, and, but you can change the world of the people just around you. And, and what that means is to bring some joy to them and to make them feel special. Uh, because I think it's easy to just worry about oneself 
And what's really important is to care about other people and you know, impact their lives. So the whistling has been uh, just a completely unexpected big part of my life. I never could have mapped this out when I was five years old, you know, trying to figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you previously worked for the White House and helped them, you know, develop some strategic messaging. What was it like doing that for such a large organization with so many different policies and guidelines and things like that? Yeah, in my career, I've worked for some great organizations and institutions, I worked on Capitol Hill for the House Budget Committee. So it's a very technical subject. And and there, that's where I really learned this humanizing thing. Yeah. Like you turn this geeky document of numbers and put human flesh on it. Like what does this budget actually mean as it relates to humans? And then when I worked at the, the White House Budget Office, it's called OMB, Office of Management and Budget. It is the budgeting arm for the federal government. It's part of the executive office of the president. And uh, there, it's, it is similar to the House Budget Committee, but the, the White House is leading this effort. And you know, the goal, again, is to, to take policy and put numbers to it because governing is all about resource allocation. You, know, you get money in in taxes and you spend the money. So the goal is, you know, how do we allocate those resources? And when you come up with policies, I mean, ultimately, those policies have impact on humans. So our big goal was to communicate effectively about how this or that or this or that policy affects actual humans. It could be Social Security. It could be Medicare. It could be the Park Service. Uh, the federal government is vast. And I'll tell you, it's a crazy, crazy fun story. So again, trying to humanize things. Um, so the budget director, uh, a man by the name of Mitch Daniels, who went on to be governor of, uh, in, of Indiana, and then he was president of Purdue for 12 years. Like, this is a serious guy. But he's very funny. Yeah. So when we put out the president's first budget, uh, we had to cut spending because there was a deficit. And so Mitch who's very witty, said, all right, this is what we're going to do. We are going to get copies of the Rolling Stones song, You Can't Always Get What You Want. And the refrain is, but if you try some time, you might just find you get what you need. So he's trying to contrast wants and needs. Yes. And I made copies of this, and this is this is, shows you how long ago it was. It was on cassette tapes, which no one uses anymore. And then when we handed out the budget to the reporters, like these are national reporters at the AP and Dow Jones and other, you know, the Washington Post, et cetera, I gave them the budget and the cassette tape. And they were like, what's that? And I said, you got to listen to that before you read the budget. And, and they all did. And then almost every article referenced this about how witty it was, but that we were trying to make a point that you can't always get what you want. But we try to give you what you need. Now, what, what ended up happening was that the the White House went berserk when they found out what we were doing. The the like the number two press person called me up and she says, "I heard you're doing this thing, which clearly is not actually happening." And I said, "No, no, it's it's happening." <laughs> and she's like, "Oh my gosh, you must stop that right now." And I was like, oh, "Okay," but we it, we sent it out like to a bunch of reporters by the time she intervened. So like, what's the point? You know, you can use humor to try to make a point and to try to uh, get things done. And Mitch was very good at use, harnessing humor to kind of further his objectives. And we, you know, we try to humanize it too. We're not just a bunch of geeky people. You know, we can have some fun. We can, we can use a Rolling Stone song to try to make a point. And I think we were effective at it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Chris, so you have a new book coming out. Tell us about it. Let's see it. All right, it's called Four Billionaires and a Parking Attendant, Success Strategies of the Wealthy, Powerful, and Just Plain Wise. So this is a book, book about how to be your best, how to be successful. And having learned this through uh, firsthand experience working with uh, 15 of some of the most successful people in the world, four, literally four billionaires, um, 
who run investment firms. Uh, the governor of Virginia, uh, Glenn Youngkin, is in there. Uh, Lou Gerstner, who is one of the greatest CEOs of the 20th century. Uh, Adina Friedman, she is the CEO and chair of NASDAQ, publicly traded company. So these are all people I've worked with firsthand. And I've seen these immensely talented people in action over a 30-year period. And I say, well, if, if Lou Gerstner or Adina or David Rubenstein or Orlando Bravo, he's another billionaire, if they do X, Y, or Z and it works for them, well, let's see if I can do that too. Right. And what's really exciting about this is that uh, each lesson is told via an anecdote. So it's very accessible. You can really get it. And they're very doable, meaning, like if I said, Megan, if you can run the Boston Marathon in three hours and 30 minutes, then you can be your best and be successful. You know, unless you're a serious runner, you would say, oh, my gosh, there's no way I can do that. And, but that's not what it is. This is about having drive, about being humble, and about being disciplined. And those are all things that you know, don't require running the Boston Marathon in a 330. Now, I'm not saying having drive and being humble and being disciplined are like necessarily super easy, but they are very achievable. And so I break these 50 lessons into these eight strategies, uh, such as to, to be innovative, to be purposeful, to build bridges with people who don't agree with you, to think of others. So people might think that, oh, there's a book about a bunch of billionaires. Why would he have a section in there on thinking of others? Well, it's amazing how generous the, the billionaires that I've worked for are. They have pledged to give away all their money. In one example, um, actually, I mentioned it earlier, Bill Conway, who gave the $5 million to the homeless shelter, he would actually roam the halls at the Carlisle Group, where we worked, with a box filled with hundreds of gift cards for Dunkin' Donuts. And, and he would knock on doors and he'd, he'd say, all right. If you promise to give these gift cards to homeless people you see on the street, I will give you as many as you want. And so I, to this day, carry those in my wallet and give them to homeless people. And I printed up a little card that tells them where to go for help because, you know, a $10 gift card is not going to change your life. Yeah. But it will help for a few moments. And then if you can get to a place that can help you with, with uh, substance abuse and housing, uh, clothing, medical care, et cetera. So that's where you really want to get mm -hmm. people. But Bill, this billionaire, could have been just making more money, roaming the halls, really helping people to think of someone other than yourself and in a way that can uh, you know, touch their heart and hopefully make their, their life a little better. And so there are just tons of lessons in here uh, about just how to be your best. You know, if you want to be a billionaire, that's fine with me. I'm a capitalist. <laughs> but that, that was not my goal. Yeah. My goal was to be the best version of me, you know, to be as strategic and be as purposeful and to be as generous and, uh, you know, be a bridge builder in how I live my life day in and day out. So there are just, uh, just amazing lessons that um, I'm really excited to share with people. The book comes out uh, in October. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping people will read it. I hope they will learn from it and hope they will benefit the way I have as well. Yeah, I'm excited to read it. You gave me a nice little taste. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited. So just kind of wrapping up, what would you say is one piece of advice that you would give to current High Point University students when it comes to building their own personal brand that reflects their own values? You know, the key is understanding oneself. Because if you understand yourself you can then effectively build your brand. And so understanding yourself takes time. It's not something that happens in a weekend. You know, to understand what's in your heart, meaning what do you want to do, or in your head, what are you able to do, takes time. So what I encourage students to do is to go through a period of discernment. Now, arguably, discernment lasts a lifetime, mm -hmm. but I think it's especially acute when someone is in their early 20s, where you're really trying to understand those strengths, weaknesses, those desires, things you like, think where areas where you've struggled. So the more you understand yourself, you'll have a much better um, 
much better kind of sense of where you should be going. Because we're all on a journey. You know, life is just this long journey. And you want it to be as fulfilling and kind of effective as possible. Which is why in, in my new book, there this the beginning section is all about purpose. Having what I call an it. Like, what is your it? Yeah. So early in my professional life, you know, being the best PR person I could be was my it. And then I become a whistler and I say, well, uh, being the best whistler I can be was my it. And your it is different than mine. And, but the key is to have one so that you have purpose. And the, the more you understand yourself, strengths and weaknesses, the better able you will be to find your it and then to actually execute on it. So it's at its core, it's understanding yourself. And the more you understand yourself, the better you will be able to communicate yourself to others and you will have purpose through that. Yeah, I love that. All right, Chris, thank you so much for sharing your extraordinary advice and achievements with us today. We're so grateful for your commitment to mentoring High Point University students and joining a remarkable and innovative program that inspires our students and campus community. Thank you. Well, it's a delight to be here, Megan. Thank you, and I wish you well uh, with your studies and with your career and with your life. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining me on the Access to Innovators podcast powered by High Point University. 